uh, welcome to the first thematic session of the 2020 Cliff Grads webinar. So I'm Siniro Costa Jr. I work for uh, CCAF's flagship tree on low emissions development. And today I will be facilitating or chairing, as you uh, will, Todd, uh, today's session that is focused on integrated and agroforestry, agroforestry systems. So to recap a little bit about thematic sessions. So uh, these thematic sessions, they have been designed to provide uh, students the opportunity to present and discuss their PhD research with colleagues and the, the guest expert. Uh, there will be four more uh, thematic sessions covering uh, pastoral and agro agronomy, uh, ruminant, rice, and uh, soil. And today, uh, we are going to have five uh, students, Cliff grad students presentation, followed by discussions. Uh, and uh, today, uh, the session will be chaired or facilitated by Todd Rosenstock. So Todd will uh, introduce himself later on. And before we start, let me only say how uh, we are going to manage today or how we intend to have this session today. So first, Todd will give, a, will give us a five minute introduction. And then we are going to have five, five minute student presentations. There will be recordings. And then we are going to move to a questions and clarification and comment uh, session. So uh, if you have a comment or a question or want to clarify some point, please uh, add that in the chat bar. So you find the chat bar here in the lower uh, uh, right uh, hand side of uh, this Zoom meeting, right? And then after these presentations, we can read out your question and then we start discussing it. So Todd, uh, again, thank you so much for being here with us and uh, um, I turn that uh, over to you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Nero. Um, one point of clarification uh, right at the start, uh, we will have, a, we'll have clarifying questions between each individual student's presentation. So if you have a specific comment about uh, why, why did you use a vent on your chamber or, or what kind of allometric model you use for this species, that's the time to, appropriate time to ask that. And when you're talking about broader, more uh, general questions that are for discussion, then we would save those for the end after we've seen all five uh, student presentations. So there's two opportunities. And of course, uh, always feel free to uh, enter information, chats, things that you're thinking into the chat box. It's an active area where you can interact despite the presentation that's going on, despite while I'm talking, uh, whatever it is, just have a conversation amongst yourself. I don't, I don't understand this. I don't believe this. This is totally fine. Um, and that's an active, an active way to participate with all your other colleagues and students that are on the chat. So I'm honored to be here today. I have to say that um, I was one of the first people to have uh, started the Cliff Grads program with uh, Merrill Richards and others uh, many years ago, uh, five, six years ago, and I've uh, lost a little bit of touch with the program. So I was very excited when I was invited here to talk today. I wasn't quite sure why, but I'm very excited to to talk. So my name is Todd Rosenstock. I'm a senior scientist at World Agroforestry Center. And so normally I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya. I've been living in either Nairobi or the Congo for the past 10 years, uh, where my work is largely focused on climate change mitigation and climate smart agriculture. And more frequently right now, it veers even further towards the adaptation. So, and you'll see some of that probably in some of what I'm gonna say. I was only asked to give five minutes. I think I've probably used two minutes already, uh, but I think, I think I'll, I'll, I'll ask Hazel for chair's prerogative and I'll go a little, perhaps a little bit longer. Let me share my screen screen and just give a very brief introduction to, to some of the things that I think about when I think about these issues. Okay, PowerPoint. So I'm, I'm here to talk to you today and thanks for the, again, the opportunity for five minutes about agroforestry and integrated systems. I'm really, over the next five minutes, I'm going to try to set my timer to make sure I know that I'm approximately on time. 
uh, over the next five minutes, I'm going to try to convince you that really integrated systems are everywhere. At the same time, they're nowhere. This means, and because they're integrated systems, they're much more complex than the sort of more simplified, straightforward systems that people are largely doing greenhouse gas work on, as well as but this all opens new opportunities. And those new opportunities lead you and provide, hopefully provide you a platform for innovative science and innovative uh, impact uh, in this area. And so I, I really see this as one of the most exciting areas to do climate change mitigation work on. And so I hope this, uh, this talk inspires you to, to start to work on these types of systems in the future. Come on. Okay. So as I said, I, agroforestry and integrated systems are everywhere. And why, why would I say that? Because I, I would argue that the most iconic systems globally, when you go outside into rural areas, are agro, agroforestry and integrated systems. Think about the tree crop systems, the parklands of West Africa that cover hundreds of, uh, or hundreds of thousands of, of hectares. Think about the silver pastoral systems of of Latin America that are that are across Brazil, Colombia, the Amazon, and everywhere basically, and so this and you can go on and on. These are the rubber systems of South and East Asia. Think about the landscapes where you you work, and when you stand out there, almost everyone, unless you're in the Midwestern United States, you see trees, and you see hey, cows and crops and everything mixed together. And so these these really are even when people are saying, sorry, I'm in the sun. Uh, even when people are, are working on more simplified systems, they're often just working on parts of the system. So they're not really working on systems at all. They're working on specific problems that, that are part of broader systems. And uh, it's a real challenge to work at this sort of systems level because there's so many different things occurring. But why do I think even though they're everywhere, I would also contend that they're nowhere. Here's a, so we did an analysis of the naturally determined contribution. So the blueprints that countries applied for the UNF triple, or put in for the UNF triple C for their climate action. So if they named, in this case, it was agroforestry in, the, in these NDCs, uh, either for mitigation or adaptation. What we found is in 148 non-Annex one countries, so this is mostly the developing world, 40% uh, had named agroforestry. They said 40% of the countries globally said agroforestry is going to be part of our, our solution for adaptation. And, and, oh, and guess what? Almost none of them actually include them in their greenhouse gas inventory. So they're not, not actually counting their benefits. So although everybody is talking about these agroforestry and integrated systems, nobody is actually doing anything about them. And, and the way that they're measuring this and the way that they're starting to act on it is actually not uh, occurring. And what this means is that there's this huge opportunity for you to have impact and for you to get information into uh, these uh, international policy arenas when you work on these systems. A lot of people are working on enteric fermentation. A lot of people are working on soil carbon. Very few people are working on these systems. Ah. But when you start thinking about systems, as I said, it, it starts to get complicated. You know, you have, this is a picture from Western Kenya and this is in, in a landscape that I worked in for many years. And what you have is these mixed systems. You have cows that are uh, producing methane. Uh, there's pasture and carbon sequestration happening. Uh, there's cash crops, that's tea in the background on the left uh, that they're using fertilizer on. So you're seeing nitrous oxide emissions. But emissions are only part of the story. Farmers in, in this location don't care about emissions much at all, but what they really care about is income diversification, you cow for in, insurance for when uh, uh, shocks happen for, them, for their lives or somebody dies, et cetera. And so when you think about systems, uh, and even when you're thinking about emissions uh, in systems, you have to start thinking about things beyond just the emissions themselves. And this is where I think it starts to get really interesting and where you start to see these overlaps between mitigation and, and complementarities between mitigation and adaptation. And what this drives you from is, uh, I think what we'll hear a lot about is about field measurements, field measurements of emissions, field measurements of sequestration. But we know that greenhouse gas accounting, so that second slide that I showed you about the greenhouse gas inventories, is essentially a function of two different things. That's emissions factors and if activity data. And there's a, been a huge push over the last 10 years for better emissions factors, especially in, in the global south. 
much less uh, information about the activity data. What are people actually doing on their farm? And guess what? There's a lot of uncer uncertainty around that. We don't know what farmers in Zambia are really doing on their farm. Um, we have very little uh, information on that. And that could completely throw off what we know about agricultural uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And so when you, do, when you widen the problem beyond just the, the simple measurement problems, you end up looking at all kinds of different types of approaches, some of which I, I imagine uh, are, or some of which are very applicable for this integrated systems uh, accounting. And that's remote sensing, aerial photography, even crowdsourcing. So sending people text messages and getting information back. And what this would allow you to do is actually uh, be able to unlock the finance needed for massive transformation at scale. And so I guess I was sort of challenged when trying to put together this presentation because the, 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 we have five talks that I think get to many pieces of this sort of framework that I've just outlined. And I guess I would challenge all of the Cliff grads, not the ones on here and hopefully the ones that will watch this at home as I think it's being recorded, and to, to think about how their work although it's just one piece of, a, of broader systems and broader sort of political economy and, and, and science on greenhouse gas emissions can lead towards this transformative impact and this transforming science uh, going forward. And with that, I think, let's go and let's get started. Thank you, Sunira. Oh, thanks a lot, Todd. That's a great presentation. Thank you so much. So uh, now uh, I think Hazel will uh, play out the recordings for five presentations uh, in a row, I guess. Greetings, my dear Cliff graduates. Greetings to my supervisors. I am Marion Gairi from Cameroon, and I'm, my host institution is Seat, Cali, Colombia. My PhD is on climate smart agricultural climate change and livelihood security. Rising fossil fuel burning and land use changes have emitted and continue to emit increasing quantities of greenhouse gases into the Earth's atmosphere. Example of these gases, we have carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. A rise in these gases equally causes a rise in the amount of heat from the sun withheld in the Earth's atmosphere. Normally, heat that is supposed to be expelled like to be sent radiated back to the to space is now retained in the atmosphere which is the main reason behind the greenhouse gas effect and subsequently climate change the ability to contain the pace of this phenomenon by keeping the change of temperature at the degree 20 degree centigrade threshold as stipulated by ipcc 2014 is now limiting and the entire universe has to suffer these consequences in this light the correlation between agriculture and climate change still stands distinct, mostly because of agriculture's impact on global food security and production. We have four objectives in this study. First is to determine the farmer's perception on climate variability, and we will need uh, data on perception on rainfall, temperature, age, hair, age, gender, household size, religion, month per capita income, primary occupation, educational status, and land ownership. The method to be used here will be descriptive analysis and binary logistic regression. Secondly, we'll have to look at the identify the climate smart practices in this area and we'll need data from on farming systems, adaptation strategies, mitigation strategies, and the types of crops cultivated. We'll use the PCA via PASS. And thirdly, we'll analyze the economic, socioeconomic determinants of farmers' adoption, adoption of these practices. We have similar data with objective one and, and here we'll be using multinomial logistic regression model we'll also evaluate the effect of these practices on livelihoods where we need data on farm income and food security and here we'll use uh, the multinomial endogenous switching regression to capture that now we we'll have data at the end on climate smart practices used in this area or practice in this area. We also have data on the factors limiting the adoption of these practices, not leaving out gen the gender aspect. We also have data, we also have information on their perception on climate variability because the way I perceive climate is not the same way 
somebody from another place will perceive claim. I might even be perceiving in my area where I am, and that person is not perceiving yet in that area. So we'll have information on their perception on climate variability. We'll also have information on those practices that will impact them positively and will impact them negatively. So we should be so at the end we'll be able to propose to them which one to adopt and which one is not advisable. Now most of the countries in Sub-Sahara Africa, including Cameroon, rely on agriculture for their income and food security. And any initiative that might help to sustain and improve productivity in agriculture would be a crucial step in improving people's livelihoods. Thus, adoption of these practices is a key step in reducing the threat of the sustainability of agricultural production in Cameroon. Climate Smart Agriculture normally is a relatively new concept which was launched in 2009 advocating for better integration of, of adaptation and mitigation actions in agriculture in order to capture synergies between them and to support sustainable agricultural development for food security under climate change this is because uh, the relationship between climate change and agriculture it's a, a two-way something. Climate change impacting on agriculture and agriculture subsequently causing climate change. So these methods were developed in order to curb that and to be able to ensure sustainable production and to improve on food insecurity. Thank you for listening. Great. Thanks, Mary. Uh, really interesting. Um, anybody have any questions? Clarification comments before we go to the next presentation. Either speak up, raise your hand, or type them in the chat. Anyone? I have a question then. Uh, Mary, how are you gonna how are you gonna document who has adopted and who has not adopted? Oftentimes. Uh, in, in this part of Cameroon, as I understand it, uh, and across much of Sub-Saharan Africa, you get partial adoption of CSA agricultural practices. What, what is, how are you determining that? Okay, what, uh, actually I've collected data already. So what, uh, how we captured it, we did a household survey. And uh, in these areas, we had a list of these practices from intercropping, agroforestry, and the others. So the, the farmer was able to, to indicate which one they are using in their farms. So that's how uh, I'm still working on the data. I'm still working on the data, but from the preliminary uh, analysis I've tried to do to look at how the data is and there are some practices actually that <laughs> are specific. Like we had two regions and we chose two regions, we selected two regions in these uh, two, sorry, two divisions in these regions each. So we realized like from the data, when I was doing the preliminary analysis, I realized that there are some particular practices that will be for a particular division, probably because of the, uh, the landscape, the environmental, other environmental uh, aspects and also with the gender rules and land tenure issues <laughs> of that area because it, it really impacted on their adopting and on their choosing a particular um, practice. So what we did is we had a list of these practices where we explained to farmers which can, what kind of uh, do you have practice this particular we try to explain to them so they understand some instances of this and yeah there is yes which reasons i've not been able to do this on my farm because of this reason this reason and that reason so that's how uh, i intend to capture which of these practices great i think that that leads into two two questions that came up on the chat uh that directly relate to what you just said. The first one is how big is your sample size? How many farmers did you uh, <clears throat> sample? And then, uh, and how were they chosen? Okay, the, the, the sample size for the two regions was uh, 400. 
I did uh, a sampling. I, did, I at the beginning I did a. I used a formula for calculating sample size for an unknown population because I could not get the population of these regions. Since Cameroon has issues on uh, population data, it's like they don't, uh, it's been long that they did the census. So I can't really have an accurate data for the population of this region. So I, what I did was I used the, the, the formula, the formula to calculate sample sizes of unknown uh, uh, populations. And now how I selected the, probably the household, I think that's what they mean. <laughs> yes, they're, they're, I think they're asking uh, what kind of procedure did you use to select the households? Okay, we did, uh, there are some areas, <laughs> at the beginning, I, what we proposed, we, we had to do, how do they, random, is it random? How do they call this? Random, Please let random me just is, explain, maybe I'm a bit tensed. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, but when we reach, there, there are some uh, villages because in each um, region we had two divisions and in each division we had village per subdivision. So now, what happened was that we did we, we did random for some villages, but some villages you, we realized that you know they have this cluster um, uh, like the, the houses were in clusters, so we had to do the cluster like from each cluster in each village we had twenty households. So when we get to the villages that the houses were in clusters, we count the number of clusters. And then we do, we, we, we now distribute how many households we, we, we visit per cluster. And now when we go to a cluster, we do random among the cluster. Great, thanks. I think that's a good example yes. for everybody who's doing uh, household surveys, that oftentimes it's, mm -hmm. you can't do it exactly. She brought up two, key points that uh, you wouldn't have necessarily expected when you were setting up the, the research questions. Yeah, this this uh, first, yes. you don't know how many people are there, so you don't know your population, and then also uh, this clustering issue uh, in household selection. And so these these will, both of these things will affect your, your research and something to consider. Um, Hello, my name is Fernanda Leite. I'm from Brazil. And my Cliff Grads host organization is in Intabalcars, located in Argentina. My PhD title is Soil Organic Matter Quality and Potential Mitigation of Greenhouse Gases in Integration Crop Livestock Forestry in the Brazilian Cerrado Biome. Brazil signed the Paris Agreement uh, in, from COP21 and the NDC, the National Determinant Contribution for Brazil, uh, is to reduce 37% of the emissions until 2025 and 43% of the emissions until 2030. And this based on the emissions from 2005. So for all the sectors, the Brazilian government created plans to achieve this goal. And for the agricultural sector, the government created the plan of low carbon agriculture that's a plan that uh, create technologies to, de to develop a more sustainable agriculture. And one of the technology is the integrated crop livestock forest uh, systems and created this network, uh, the ECLF network, to uh, implement this technology and to increase the, the areas from the agricultural areas with this technology and nowadays. Uh, the Brazil has 15 million hectares with this uh, technology. So, this technology, integrated crop livestock forest, um, uh, in the, has in the same area three components, annual crops, uh, pastures with animals, and forestry. So, both of the components can have benefits between each other as nutrient cycling and protect this, the soil quality 
and uh, carbon storage in trees and in the soil. So my global objective from my PhD thesis is to access the quantity and quality of soil organic matter and greenhouse gas flows in the integration crop livestock forest systems with different tree densities and ages of the implementation in the Siom Cerrado biome. So my spec, uh, specific objectives are to determine soil organic carbon stock in the ECLF systems, evaluate soil nitrous oxide and methane flows from soil and determine the organic functional groups of the soil organic matter. My field experiment is located at Embrapa, that's Agriculture Brazilian Research Corporation. Uh, in this experiment, it has uh, five systems uh, with different ages of implementation and densities of trees. And we're going to open trenches in each, of the, in each system uh, where we are going to collect in the format samples to, to, to access the book density and the format samples to, to access the carbon content. And other, other analysis for the soil quality made from these trenches too. The gas from the soil will be accessed by the static chamber methodology, where we bury uh, the bases from the chamber and close it with the top. And then with a syringe, we take the samples and analyze in the gas chromatographer. Then we can have the flux and then they, we can calculate the accumulated emission in the period. The soil organic matter quality will be analyzed by the nuclear magnetic resonance from carbon-13 spectroscopy and Fourier transformed infrared spectroscopy that we can see the, fu the functional groups of the molecule. To finish, the integration crop livestock forest system is a technology that increases the production and profitability compared to a monoculture and ensure food security. So uh, decrease deforestation because you are using areas that are already open. You, are, you can recover degraded areas with this technology. So we don't need to open new areas to implement this technology and the best one, decrease the greenhouse gas balance. So this, with this technology, we see that produce and preserve is possible. And this technology is increasing a lot in Brazil, and that's what I'm gonna study. Uh, and uh, perhaps we can take advantage of uh, this moment to take our clarifying questions from Fernanda's presentations, that presentation that we, we jumped. Uh, so Fernanda, would you like to uh, uh, make uh, a question, a comment, or a clarification? Anybody has a, a point for Fernanda's presentation? We have some questions in the chat. So uh, questions from Fernanda. How are you going to take care of spatial distribution of carbon within the farm where livestock graze and congregate? Water points and pens. Yes, we are going to take care about it. Uh, we are going to collect to make a tran transact. In the presentation, I didn't have time to to say about this, news, but we are going to uh, open trenches near trees and enter the rows, in the, enter the tree rows in the crops uh, or in the pastures. Um, so we are going to take care about these uh, degrees of we need to see what's the difference in the soil or in the gases. We are gonna collect samples from soil and gases in um, a lot of distance from trees, uh, near trees or in the middle of the inter rows. Great, and there is uh, another question that could you uh, kindly explain the significance of the fun functional uh, groups? Yes, it's uh, organic functional groups is, uh, from the organic matter. They, um, we need to access this because it explains how is the structure of the organic matter. 
so we can see if it's liable or it's more refractory uh, with uh, as with LinkedIn and which kind of carbon is there. So we can see because one of the um, stabilization process is the biochemistry of the the carbon. So we need to to see these functional groups the, of the organic matter molecules. I have a question for Fernanda. Yes. Sarah. Go ahead, Sarah. Um, Fernanda, I would like to know, um, I'm very interested in the quantification of nitrous oxide. So maybe if you can deepen more in the, how, you, how are you going to take the samples for the quantification of nitrous oxide? Um, so I, how many samples are you gonna take in one day, in which hours of the day, or maybe deepen a little bit more there? Yes, so the best time we have a work here in Brazil is to collect between 8 and 10 a.m. Uh, right in the morning. Um, we collect four samples uh, because um, I hear just the final of your answer. Can you repeat the full? Because it broke the, the connection, I don't know what happened. You want to know the time of the collection? And yeah, the times and how many samples through the day. Yeah, so the best one and uh, the best uh, practice to take four samples per day because you can have a more accurate calculate of the flux. But you can, you cannot do this, you can collect three. So, um, but the best one is collect four. Uh, there are people that collect two, but the best one is to collect four. So we are going to try to collect four samples per day. In our plan, uh, plan, plan management is to collect uh, four samples. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Just to clarify, Fernanda, um, nobody, nobody should collect two samples and, and estimate a flux. That's, that's, that's bad practice. And uh, so we should make sure that people know that. Um, in terms of, and just you're talking about four samples over the course of a half hour or an hour, right? Or you're talking about over the course of the whole day? No, just uh, to, during the deployment, the deployment period, it's like 30 minutes or 40 minutes. Perfect. I think I, I think I just wanted to make sure that make sure that that was what you were talking about. That's what I thought. Yes. But I wanted. Yeah. And, and the GRA, um, Sarah, the GRA has put out some very good nitrous oxide uh, chamber methodology protocols. So if you don't have those, um, there's a number of them out there from different, different organizations. But I think the most recent and one of the best is really the GRA who's funding this uh, cliff grad. So um, you should definitely look at those. It goes into all of these issues about uh, deployment times, diurnal variation, fluxes. Um, vents and all of these very specific things that can have a very big impact on your uh, flux measurements. So please check them out. And if not, feel free to email me and I'll point them. I will give okay. them. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Todd. I'll look for them. <laughs> Thanks. Can I, uh, can I also come in, Fernanda? Please. Okay. Maybe, maybe to, to, to help uh, on. Uh, how we can uh, uh, work on the number of samples to take. Sometimes we might need to pre-sample and do the uh, linear regression and see uh, whether these, these need to take two or five samples. Maybe the emissions are very low, so that uh, just taking two samples is okay uh, because the, uh, maybe uh, the fluxes are linear. Uh, we're talking of maybe in, in, like in sub-Saharan Africa, we're talking of um, very low fluxes, so that you cannot go to to even five samples. So it it, it means you can do a pre-sampling, uh, so that you can really see whether there is uh, a linear kind of uh, a flux or not, so that it warrants you taking uh, five samples, you taking three samples or so. Thanks. It's a question for me. Yeah, Fernanda, it's just a comment, uh, kind of. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry. Okay. 
Yeah, I, I, I'd be, I'd welcome to for you to send me the the research that that shows that on well. We need to be very careful about uh, flux measurements, especially of trace gases. Are uh, I agree are very can be very low, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. And so, but drawing uh, drawing conclusions from two points is a uh, not not good practice. So three points can be done. Two points is not good practice. Hello everyone. I am Sara Valencia from Colombia and I'm currently doing my PhD on science in ecology and sustainable development in Mexico at the College of the Southern Border. This is a research center that is part of the system of public research centers of the National Council of Science and Technology of Mexico. My host organization is the International Center of Tropical Agriculture at Palmira, Colombia. And the title of my thesis is Use and Anthetic Methane Mitigation Potential of Forest Species of the Mexican Tropic. Extensive cattle production systems in tropical regions have generated severe impact on soil and ecosystems and continue to promote land use change. These are also less efficient due to the low quality of the pasture, poor management, and its dependence on external inputs. Additionally, these systems have a higher contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. However, Tropical regions worldwide have a high forest biomass production from trees, shrubs, and herbaceous plants with high nutritional quality with the potential to be used as suitable feed alternative in sustainable livestock system and reduce methane emissions. The Lacandon Rainforest is located to the east and northeast of the state of Chiapas in southern Mexico. One of the main economic activities of the indigenous peasant of this region is extensive cattle production and has generated the greatest changes in land use in the history of the Lacandon rainforest. The biodiversity of this region is one of the most important in the country. This characteristic allows a reconversion of the livestock to our sustainable systems through the use of native resources that have the potential to reduce methane emissions and rehabilitate degraded areas. The general objective is to identify forest species little study in the southern Mexico and to evaluate their effect on the synthesis of methane in the rumen, nutritional quality, effect on animal behavior, and their potential in tropical livestock systems. Some of the specific objectives are to identify multiple use species and their capacity to mitigate enthetic methane as an additional ecosystem service based on the information from previous studies, to quantify the nutritional value content of secondary metabolites, measurement of kinetic fermentation parameters, and in vitro methane production of forage species. And to evaluate the effect of diets with forage species containing secondary metabolites on enthetic methane production measured in open circuit respiration chambers and rumen microbiome of cattle. In the first experiment, enthetic methane mitigation potential of forage species from southern Mexico were evaluated. The samples were taken in the municipality of Ocosingo Valley that covers the largest region of the Lacandon rainforest. The species used for the study were selected based on local knowledge and cultural importance for livestock producers. A total of 15 species were collected. Chemical analysis and secondary metabolite quantifications were carried out. In vitro digestibility, and in vitro gas production technique was used to quantify methane production by chromatography at 12, 24, and 48 hours of incubation. In the second experiment, enthetic methane mitigation potential of three species from tropical regions supplemented at two levels on a grass-based diet was evaluated. Uh, five species were selected from the previous experiment and evaluated at 15 and 30% mixed with a pasture, also in vitro grass production technique was used to quantify methane production in this experiment. In the third experiment, the evaluation of the effect of two forest species from southern Mexico on enthetic methane production and rumen microbiome will be carried out. 
This experiment was programmed by April, but due to COVID-19, it has been delayed and we're hoping to start by the end of September. So in this experiment, three different diets will be evaluated in a crossover land square design where six cannulated heifers will be used. Methane production will be measured in two open circuit respiration chambers. There will be other variables that will be measured. And for this experiment, my Cliff grad supervisor contacted investigators from Tia Gask in Ireland. So hopefully I will have the opportunity to carry out DNA extraction and sequencing from rumen samples of this experiment there. These are the species that have been evaluated in each experiment and the ones that will be evaluated in the last one. The expected outcomes are select promising species for enteric methane mitigation in tropical systems of southern Mexico, verify the mitigation potential of native species evaluated in vitro in an in vivo trial using the gold standard method for the quantification of enteric methane, advancing the knowledge of the ruminal microbiome by quantifying the effect of secondary plant metabolites on ruminal population and their contribution to methane synthesis. Motivate research and evaluation of the use of native species for greenhouse gas mitigation and animal production in tropical regions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, any, any clarifying questions? I guess my first clarifying question is, how are you going to do all that during a PhD? That's a serious <laughs> amount of work. Well, I already started. The two first in vitro experiments, we already, we, they, we already made them. So, mm -hmm. so we have some, uh, some, something advanced there. And yeah. the second one, well, the last experiment is the one that I'm worried about because I was going to do it the, starting this year, but due to COVID-19, we have to, we're gonna have to start by September, I think. And that's, mm. that's a, a long experiment, but I hope I can make it. Mm. Yeah. Are there other questions? Uh, there's a question in the chat, Sarah, uh, the palatability of those materials for animals. Okay, uh, those species were, were selected from previous studies, they, in those studies, they evaluated the, the, um, the intake of these species in, in cattle, but they, they were made through the observation of the livestock producers. So some of these producers from these regions, they use secondary vegetation, like in dry season, some of them, not all and they, they take the cattle to pasture in secondary vegetation and they have been observing through many years what cattle are actually eating on that secondary vegetation. So from those studies, I, I selected those species. So really important to use things that uh, farmers want. So yeah. nice job. Yes, um, it's, it's, we are considering like cultural importance and all of that to select those species. Great, great. Thank you very much. Sinero, is the next presentation uh, queued up? Thank you, our sponsors, for the opportunity given. My name is Lawal Abdul Hakim Ahmed. I'm a Nigerian. My host organization and country is Soil Research Institute, Ashanti, Ghana. My PhD research topic is a vascular plant diversity and above ground plant biomass in relation to land use type in Bigawa State, Nigeria. Savannah ecosystems are being degraded by land use change and other environmental factors, thereby exposing numerous vascular plant species to vulnerability. This has actually contributed to uh, loss of many indigenous vascular species and uh, influenced lots of uh, environmental problems in northern Nigeria. Northwest Nigeria is characterized with average small diameter trees, shrubs, and then grasses that serve environmental, recreational, and medicinal functions. However, uh, the continued existence of uh, these valuable resources in Dikawa State is at uh, risk of loss due to annual bushfire 
uh, soil compaction as a result of uh, overgrazing slash and bone agriculture or controlled usage of agrochemicals and then fuel with extractions. There is a mutual relationship between soil, vascular plant diversity and the biomass accumulation, hence the following specific objectives. One, to assess vascular plant species composition and distribution in different land use types, to determine the relationship between soil nutrient composition and uh, with the species diversity across the land use types, to determine the effect of land use on above ground plant biomass, and lastly, to assess the effect of land use on the, on the socioeconomic livelihoods of the people in the study area. Now, this is the study area description. The major land use here are crop farm, agroforestry plots, grazing roots, fallow lands, and then protected areas. These are the land use types on which this study is going to focus on. Sampling procedure. 500 by 100 meter sample plots with three replicates will be randomly established on each of the land use types. Within each one hectare plot, one 5 by 5 meter soft plots will be located at each of the four corners and then the center, while one meter by one meter micro plots would also be allocated on each of the four corners at this and at the center of each five meter soft plots as been depicted on the sample plots layout. Now, three species would be investigated within the 100 by 100 meter sample plots, while uh, shrubs and then saplings would only be restricted for investigation within the soft plots. Herbaceous species and then seedlings would be investigated within the mini plots, that's the one meter by one meter plots, mini plots. Now, objective two. 100 by 100 meter sample plots would be randomly selected of each of the land use types and then would be divided into three equal parts from which soil samples will be collected use, using a soil core sampler at three different steps with their respective uh, replicates. Objective three, two soil, two soil plots would be randomly selected at each of the land use types for the above ground plant biomass estimation. All woody species with diameter at stump height greater than or equals to 5 cm within the two subplots will be estimated using indirect biomass estimation. Uh, questionnaire would be administered in the case of uh, Objective 4. Now, data analysis. Objective 1 will be estimated and then presented in tables, charts, such that it will reflect uh, density, frequency, important value index, family important value index, and some other ecological parameters, after which one with analysis of variance will be used to test for the differences in mean values of our three species composition across the different land use types. Now, for objective two, soil physical properties will be analyzed to determine soil total porosity and then water holding capacity. Soil particle size, texture, and some selected chemical properties will be analyzed in the laboratory while the data generated will be subjected to PCA. Uh, objective 3, indirect biomass allometric equation model developed by a shape at all will be used to estimate three biomass, uh, uh, three biomass. and then uh, one, uh, one analysis of variance would also be uh, uh, used here, and then lead square will be applicable via any date. Chi-square will be used to run the analysis in the case of uh, objective 4. Output. The effect of different land use types on the composition and distribution of woody species will be investigated. The relationship between selected soil nutrient composition and woody species diversity across land use types will be established. The outcome of this work will allow us to identify the best land use options in terms of our biomass stock for sustainable woody species diversity management in Jigawa State. Lastly, the effect of land use on the socioeconomic livelihoods of the people in the study area would be investigated. Thank you for this coming. Great, thank you, Abdul. Thank you. Um, any okay. clarifying questions? I feel like I saw some in the chat. Did, did they want to raise them themselves? Armwell? Uh, one of the questions was, what are the land use types and 
and that you are looking at and I think the land use type should be in the specific objective so that it is clear. Um, seems more of a comment, but uh, Abdul Hakim, did you want to expand on this? Uh, that if uh, the land use types could be embedded in the objectives? Uh, yes, they're just clear more, uh, they're clear in the, um, in the presentation. And I think is more of a comment. Any other clarifying okay. questions? Sinero, any clarifying question? No, not from my side. Other questions, comments? Uh, either I, we saw a lot of different suggestions of methods being being presented today. We saw spectroscopy. We saw uh, respiration chambers. Uh, other, any comments that can help uh, lead into your own research? Sebastian, you're muted if you're trying to say something. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was I was thinking about methodology, um, and yeah, I wonder if someone of the presenters uh, is going to talk about the how the methodology is adapted to the uh, assume linearity or not non-linearity of the flux so that that is an important topic to define the number of samples that we are going to take per chamber because sometimes uh, in soils that are not frequently annihilated or flo flooded uh, perhaps uh, the flux tend to be uh, more linear than in other kind of soils or also depends of the design of the chamber. That's why I am very glad that the GRA has published uh, this last update on the protocols. Did anybody like to respond to Sebastian? We heard many people talking about fluxes. Fernanda? Okay. Um, anyone, anyone else have any comments on methods? So with Sebastian, we heard another call to, um, to read the protocols. So uh, this, is a, this is great to see the, the synergies between the GRA research arm in directly informing the the Cliff Grads research. This is this is great. I have to say I use the the old ones uh, quite often in my own research. Other other comments. We also saw some people. There was a previous question about endogenous switching. Mary, did you want to talk a little bit about in, what endogenous switching is and why people use it? Mary, maybe, maybe, maybe Mary's not there. Um, any other ideas? I can see Mary. Um, I've just requested that she unmute. But mm. one thing we didn't see. Well, we'll we'll just if she uh, comes back, we'll we'll go with her. One thing we didn't see a, a lot about was uh, woody biomass. When we start talking about integrated systems, uh, uh, we, saw, we, we heard about the uh, pecans and I think it was Fernanda's uh, uh, experiment, um, but we didn't actually see people talking about measuring woody biomass. And um, there, there's a lot of conversion of forests and a lot of loss of carbon in woody biomass. And there's also a lot of carbon stored in, and accumulated in biomass. And so is anybody working on, on projects with woody biomass and measuring woody biomass in this, on this group? Sebastian, if you're trying to speak again, it looks like you're still unmuted. 
<laughs> no, sorry. Uh, sorry, okay. because when, when you mentioned biomass, I was thinking in another methodolog methodological aspect that is the biomass uh, growing inside the chamber uh, when you are trying to evaluate emissions in an integrative system. Uh, because you know the, the, the grass there yeah. is always growing, so you have to control that. Yeah. And uh, there are different approaches to that issue. And sometimes uh, people just cut that grass growing there. And there are other people uh, like uh, supporting the chamber with another ring or another um, another base. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, ch changing the volume of the, the chamber during the, the sampling. So I wonder always uh, which one is the best approach to, uh, to solve that issue. Uh, is this a question that, that you'd like feedback on? Or is there, is, do other people have comments on what they think is the best approach? Sinero, do you have a comment on what you think is the best approach? Well, yeah, we, we know that uh, the volume of the chamber influences the fluxes calculation, right? And of course, if the uh, biomass that is growing inside a chamber uh, should be accounted if this biomass is significant, right? Uh, of course, we need to take it into consideration. Uh, but, uh, depending on, well, and there's also the issue of the length of the, the experiment, right? So, but my first reaction is that I don't think we should bother on the grass that is go, growing inside of a chamber because the biomass can be relatively low, right? Uh, depending on uh, the size of the chamber you have. But uh, Todd, any uh, thoughts on, on how to proceed in terms of calculating the volume or should we uh, mow this, this grass inside of the chamber? What, what is the recommendation? Yeah, um, in all of my experiments, we cut, we cut the grass. Um, mostly because we were thinking about soil flux and, uh, only. And so, this, so we ended up cutting the grass. Great. And okay. uh, another, yeah. Armwell. Go ahead, yeah. please, Shumba. Go ahead. Yeah. My, 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 think, my take on this is, uh, is, uh, is, is that uh, it depends on the objective, whether it's uh, soil emission or you want to also uh, maybe take care of um, uh, crop, crop's emission, but mainly it will be carbon dioxide. So if we're dealing with soil emission, uh, like Todi said, uh, you just have to cut the grass. So it depends on the objective that you're working on. So that's my thinking, that's my take on this. 100% agree with that and and yeah. so and I think that's yeah. what you would see in most of the most of the most of the documents as well. Um, yeah, and, and it going looks like, back uh, to the oh, sorry, go ahead, the, to, to the original uh, Todd's uh, question on uh, how uh, you are uh, measuring uh, woody biomass, right? And uh, I wonder how Fernanda is uh, doing to measure the pecan uh, growth along her experiment. So is, is there any, what, what is the, the, the methodology, Fernanda, uh, you are using to measure this woody uh, biomass growth? So uh, in my thesis, uh, and I will not uh, uh, collect this data. I'm gonna collect just soil I see the structure of the organic matter and the soil organic carbon and um, the quality of the, the soil organic matter and the soil fluxes, um, the, the gases. But another uh, studies, studies, students will analyze this with another thesis. Uh, just to clarify, uh, when Fernanda is going to come uh, to Argentina, uh, and I hope that to be soon, uh, once this uh, COVID pandemic finishes, um, she will going to be measuring the emissions going out from the soil. 
So the pecan growth uh, is there, or the, the pecan trees are there only as like um, a sort of, or disturb of the environment of that uh, pasture growing there. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't quite, I quite get that. Can you re re repeat that, Sebastian? That uh, uh, we have a, um, a plot with uh, pecan growing there. As I said in the chat, they are seven years old plants. We have uh, those plants in the, under the framework of a bigger national network for pecan. Um, and that soil, except for the uh, pecan planting, uh, hasn't been disturbed for seven years. We have already characterized, characterized the soil chemically and physically. Um, the idea is, uh, well, to, to work on those parameters, on soil parameters, and not that much in uh, the tree parameters. Of course, that we are uh, taking measurements of the tree growing there, uh, mostly uh, on phenology of the tree. But uh, as part of Fernanda's training, uh, we are focusing on how to do the sampling, how to install the chambers, uh, what is the right place, um, and so on. Yes, but this is, uh, yeah, go ahead, Todd, please. Yeah. I'm just asking if uh, Gire is there. Um, yeah, I'm here. Can you, has, can you hear me? Has the, yes. Yes, my apologies. Yeah. I was muted. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, regarding the uh, sampling uh, method that was earlier discussed, I think uh, changing the volume is going to matter because of the flux. The more the volume, the less the flux. So I think uh, what we normally do is that uh, we get a place uh, adjacent to the place of sampling where it is free of grasses, maybe the spare soil, and then we take sample there. And then where we are taking our sample, we consider the biomass and the soil. Then at the end of the day, you now take the water sample from the bare soil, you minus it, you can get the flux from the biomass. But uh, when you start uh, sampling, maybe at the first stage, if you are dealing with like uh, rice, in the first uh, three weeks, the rice is, uh, the height is going to be taken care by the uh, volume of a, a particular volume. But when the uh, plant uh, get taller, and then you now change the volume, I think there is going to be differences in the fluxes from the initial point of start and then toward the end. So if you want to take care of the biomass, uh, that is the uh, plant uh, that is growing in the chamber, you take an adjacent place where it is free of the grasses, you take the sample there, and then you take that of the biomass, and then you minus it, and then you get what you have. But like somebody said, it depends on what you are measuring. Are you taking the emissions, but from the soil and the biomass, or you are taking the fluxes only that is coming from the biomass? So that will determine how best you will now go on with your sample. So that's my contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Juan Pablo asked a question in the chat that, um, Juan, Juan Pablo, did you want to ask or make the, your comments uh, to the group? Hi, uh, it was more, more like a comment because mm -hmm. you were proposing like uh, we, nobody addressed the topic of biomass in, in trees and I, I'm working on that topic and actually it's quite difficult to find how we are going to do, how we estimate or measure carbon sequestration. Uh, I mean, the PhD is just four years and you cannot go to the field every year to measure the trees and then to try to estimate how much has a tree grown. So we have to rely on 
Arometric equations, but these are not developed for most of the species, at least in the neotropic. So I was wondering if any of the the guys or the people that is participating or you has any experience with this. Thanks. Does anybody have any experience with this that they'd like to share? No one. De Niro, do you have experience with uh, elementary equations? Well, uh, not really. I know that okay. there are m many of them out there, and uh, <laughs> when it yeah, but when it comes to to um, uh, agroecosystems with different uh, species, it can be challenge challenging indeed. And uh, to be honest, I don't know how to address that. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so largely, uh, people are using mixed species allometric equations f in those mm -hmm. kinds of situations. They're the. I'm, it's hard for me to understand whether or not they're they're less accurate because they're mixed species, or they're less accurate uh, depending on if you're in an agricultural setting, because agricultural trees are not growing in the same way that forest trees are growing, which is where most uh, species allometric equations are. Uh, coming from, so they actually went into the forest and harvested trees to to, to develop those uh, equations. And so, it, in a lot of ways, it's you you can use those mixed species allometric equations depending usually on your your sort of uh, climate zone. And but it it at least give you some estimate of of biomass and, and uh, potential biomass gain. And so this is this is probably the the best estimate that you can get without going out there and, um, as you say, measuring every year and and uh, doing destructive sampling. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Can I? Well. So. Yeah. Actually, I just finished a paper and we are is almost ready to submit because we are trying to propose a, an idea how to to deal with this problem because. It's not about the estimating the carbon content. It's about uh, estimating the carbon sequestration potential. And if, of course, if we are in a forest plantation, then it's easy to know how old is the, the plantation and then we can uh, try to estimate for how long this tree is going to grow. But when you are in, in, in farms, in small farms where there is no data about how old is the tree, or sometimes there is not even information about uh, the species uh, growing type. So mm. that I think that is one of the lacks of information. Yeah, the, yeah. There's very little information on of trees on farm. Uh, I'd be v very keen to see the the paper that you're that you're about to put out and and hear more about the, your proposed solution for this. Okay. <laughs> and uh, if I may recommend that there is also a paper published in 2018 from um, CKF's colleague called uh, Diana Feliciano, and I can uh, email you all this paper. So she basically did a literature review on uh, above ground and below ground uh, carbon sequestration in many types of agroforestry systems. And she put together lots of references for doing this uh, review that can, uh, I'm pretty sure that it can uh, help you out trying to figure out uh, ways to, to measure and to compare different types of uh, uh, agroforestry uh, systems. Yeah, thanks. Uh, actually, I, I I read that paper and I cited it. So I hope it gets published, then I could share. Yeah. In the, the paper that's come out more recently than Diana's paper is the Remy Cardinal paper, which was revising the IPCC estimates for agroforestry in environmental research letters. Oh, okay. I will check. Uh, because also I'm using drones to try to to cover bigger areas, so yeah, that would be the next step. Yeah, and it, from the drones, you're trying to to correlate tree cover or, or 
our crown area with with a uh, biomass. So the goal. Yeah, from the drones you can get uh, tree height and and mm. crown diameter. Then you can use an equation to estimate uh, biomass. Mm. But what, again, what kind of sensor it, do you have on the drone? Uh, no, I am just using RGB. But it's possible mm. with photogrammetry. Ideally, I will be using lighter, but uh, yeah. Yeah, sounds great. Thanks for uh, this. Is taking the conversation into a whole different direction, which is important for the integrated systems because there's nitrous oxide happening, there's biomass, uh, and everything. So, thanks. Thanks for sharing, Pablo. Yeah, and, and Todd, I think our uh, time is up. Okay. In the in the again, I thank you so much for uh, uh, taking the time to talk to us and being here with us and share uh, uh, your experience in this field. Uh, I also thank all the students that uh, uh, showed up, and I really hope you have uh, enjoyed uh, this session. And as I said four more uh, technical uh, sessions uh, will be out in the next uh, weeks. So please uh, stay tuned. And um, uh, if you have any doubt, once to, to follow up on any topic, please do not hesitate to email us, right? We are uh, happy to, to help. And, uh, and I bet Todd is also uh, happy to help uh, on his end. And uh, Hazel, would you like to uh, put something before we wrap up? Just to reiterate what you've said, Samiro, thank you so much to Todd for um, chairing the session. It's been really, really valuable to all of the students, I'm sure. And I'm also sure that there are probably a lot of questions that were unsaid. Um, so what we will do is we'll have a, an email chain of everyone who's attended this meeting and we will send out the resources that have been discussed and anyone can kind of add any of the publications that have been discussed to that email chain. Yeah. So thank you once again to everyone. And thank you, Sunero, as well. Thanks, Thanks you everybody. Think so. Have a great bye. night, day, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you. you. Bye, Todd. Enjoy the bye. sunshine. Yeah. <laughs> have a good day.